In My Eyes by Minor Threat. Oh my God, that song practically changed my life, just that one song. You know, there's so many like Uniform Choice songs, like you think you got a choice. You know, there's so many great songs from Uniform Choice. Let me think of ones that really hit hard. You know what was another great Straight Edge song? Was that Chain of Strength song, True Till Death. What an amazing song that was. It was just like an anthem. So when you think of like anthems that come to, come to mind. Oh, actually, what am I talking about? There's so many great SSD songs. <laughs> you know, those like, you, you just like pick pretty much every single SSD song was a straight edge song. So you could just like pick any one. Man, the first hardcore show I ever saw was incredible. You know, like I, like I was telling you before, I was from Westchester. I was from Westchester, but I was completely 100% into punk. Like, I love punk. I had like every record. I used to listen to that WNYU radio show, Noise the Show. You know, it was like Bad Brains, Minor Threat. So I, I absolutely loved the music, but my father hated New York City and he would never let me go there. And plus, you know, back then the show started super late. I mean, you go to a show, it started at midnight. I'm like 15 years old, I gotta be at school the next day. How am I gonna go to a show? You know what I mean? So there was one show and it was Rock Against Reagan and it started during the day. And I was like, shit, I can freaking be back home before my dad knows I even left. So I took the train down to New York City and it was in Central Park, it was Rock Against Reagan. And um, that band, The Crucifix played, um, but the headlining was MDC. And I loved MDC. I had, the record. I had every single song memorized. I'd never been to a show. Can you imagine? I didn't even know what slamming was. Like I would see it on TV and stuff, but like I had no idea. Like I'd never seen slamming. I was probably 15 years old or something like that. And so uh, Crucifix played. They were kind of like a weirder band. No one moshed or did anything or stage dived. And then MDC went on. And every, the place went nuts. I was like, oh my God, they're slammed, they're stage diving. And I like jumped in. I probably heard a bunch of people. I was like jumping off the stage, singing along. It was so amazing to me that you could get on the stage with the singer and you could grab the mic from the singer and sing into the microphone. Like it was a whole different experience from going to like a rock show, which was like the only shows that I had ever gone to. And let me tell you from that show, forget it. That was it. I was like, I was a hardcore kid from then on. Everybody must say it, but it's got to be CBGB's. It's got to be CBGB's. I mean, that club was just incredible. Yeah, I miss the Anthrax too in Connecticut. That was a good show. And that was more of like our thing, which was kind of cool. But damn, man, CBGB's, those were the best shows I ever saw was at CBGB's for sure. You know what? I've been agonizing over this question because it's like, you got John Watson, who's OG. I mean, he's the original. He invented moshing. I mean, let's face it. And I even like, you know, I, I was going to shows back then. I, I remember him dancing. Harley, too, would, would also mosh. I remember those two being like, you know, the two guys who would actually do this. But, you know, John Watson, just for his stage diving and like the guy would like take over the pit. And he was just, the guy had so much style. But I don't know, man, Carl Mosh, that guy was incredible. I mean, that guy probably could have salsa danced and been incredible. He was just like this, he just had so much, just the way he moved, he just had so much style. Everybody wanted to just like dance, dance like him. So I would say those two guys. But also, one of the unsung moshers of New York hardcore, Ray Capo. Give it up for Ray Capo. That guy was great. I mean, he would do like the mosh across the stage on his knees. No one did that. I mean, he kind of brought his own thing to it too. Those three guys, blueprint for New York hardcore mosh right there. You know, I, I've been thinking about this one too. It's like everybody was funny back then. Everybody was a friggin' character. You know, the whole scene's just a bunch of characters. You know, I thought one of the funniest guys was Ray Bees. Even like the whole Biddy Bo thing, he was just like so off the wall. You never met anybody like Rabies back in like the suburbs, you know what I mean? He was just funny, even when he wasn't intentionally trying to be funny, he was, he was funny. So, I don't know, Rabies, Vinny Stigma was also friggin' funny. Between those two guys, Jimmy Gestapo was funny too. Those three guys.
You know what's cool? I actually saw, I, I pretty much went to every show that I wanted to see. There was one show that escaped me. I went to my senior prom and I missed Dag Nasty with Dave Smalley singing. They played at the Anthrax with Crippled Youth. And I really wanted to go to that show and I, was, and, you know, I love Dag Nasty. And I went to the prom and then he quits Dag Nasty and, get, and they get that other singer. So I never got to see Dag Nasty with Dave Smalley. I was always like, why did I go to the friggin' prom? Damn. I never lived in a squat, but let me tell you, I've stayed in more squats than I care to even remember. You know, you today went on that tour in Europe and we just stayed a squat every night. And it was just like, we stayed at some pretty kind of, kind of cool ones that were, you know, clean and pretty progressive. Like they actually took over the building and, you know, they made it an actual building. And then I've stayed in squats where there's just like piss everywhere. And, you know, oh, yeah, I've, I've, stay, I've slept in many squats. You know, you got to go with Mackie. You got to go with Mackie. I, you know, I was lucky enough to play with Mackie. Mackie played in Shelter for about a year. What an incredible drummer. I mean, just the, just the stuff that he thinks of that like, he's so outside of the box of just a regular hardcore drummer. You know, he has a whole kind of, I don't even know, I don't even know what you call it, jazz or fusion or, or whatever, but he's just, he's amazing. What a player that guy is. You know, Sammy, I played with that guy forever. He was awesome when he was like 14. You know, he would play like this. You know, he could play super fast. He was, he was just great. Um, man, Armand. I mean, the guy played like a caveman and it was like exactly what you wanted. I mean, it was just like his mosh beats and he would hit the drums so hard. Those three guys were like really like my favorite drummers for sure. Kids today have things so freaking easy. They have it so easy, like, you know, back in the, I don't want to sound like one of these back in the day type of guys, you know, but back, you know, in our day, touring with, I mean, can you imagine touring without GPS? Do you know what that was like? You'd have to get a map and you'd have to like, we got lost every single time we would come to a show. Like it was so hard, it was so like tedious and hard. You had to play in a band and like, you know, to even like promote your band, you didn't have the internet, you know, so everything was like, a hundred times harder, you know, but we still did it because, you know, because we loved it. Nowadays, I hear kids that are like in a band, they're like, we're not going to, we're not going to go to a show if we have to travel in a car. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? You get in that fucking car and you go drive as long as you have to, to play your freaking show. It's like, you do it because you love it. And you will, and if you love it, you will do it against all odds. You know what I mean? So I think kids got to get that spirit back of like, you want to play hardcore, you want to be a touring band, you get out there and you just play in front of anybody. You know, it doesn't matter if you got no gas or you're not getting paid for it. You just go out and you do it because you love to do it and you're moved to do it. When you were talking, it, 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 what flashed in my head was that picture of you in front of the van with all the graffiti on it. Yeah. When you're like, you know the picture I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. you're like this. And yeah. that, that van is like, should be the Smithsonian. You know how much we bought that van for? <laughs> $300. Three hundred. It was my last three hundred dollars to my name. I took that money. I spent it on a van. I had. I didn't have a dollar to my name after that. And that van lasted for a couple of years. Pretty miraculous. That was youth of today. Yeah, it was a youth of today's van. <laughs> it looks like you were having the time of your life. And not only that, to start it, we pulled the cover off the van because to start it, you'd have to put your hand into the carburetor because the carburetor didn't pull the air in properly. So you'd pull your hand in to start it and like flames would shoot out, like burn your hand, just like starting the car. It was like, you know, whatever you, whatever you got to do, you do it. <laughs> hardcore's never going to die. I mean, it, it, it was like when I was into hardcore and all the older kids would say hardcore was dead. You got to start playing something else. It's like, are you kidding me? As long as there's kids that are like, don't fit in at school and they're like a little pissed off and a little angry at their parents. It's going to be hardcore, you know, because it's such an outlet for that. Hardcore is never going to die.